So we're gonna look, we're gonna continue again on the characteristics of autism and how uh, children with autism are identified. One of the things we wanna look at is repetitive and restricted behaviors. And your text talks about this quite a bit, but there's four criteria that students have to meet. Uh, the first is repetitive speech. So you might see students um, repeating words or phrases frequently. The other thing that goes on in to this is repetitive movement. So, you know, that traditional hand flapping that we sometimes think of uh, with kids on the autism spectrum. Lining objects up. Have you seen a student that does that? Kind of takes things and always wants them to be lined up and organized in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> Also, excessive reliance on routines. So they have rituals or routines that they do every day or at certain times of the day. They value sameness, okay? Just to give you a kind of a simple example on this, uh, my brother Phil, he has a lot of rep uh, repetitive and restricted behaviors. One of his is all about time. So he goes to work. He has to report to work every morning at 8 um, he wants you to pick him up at 7.53, okay? Not 7.54, not 7.52. He wants you to pick him up at 7.53. If you get there at 7.50, you will see him in his apartment, and he will wait until 7.53 to open the door and come out and get in the car. So that's an example of really um, insistence on sameness, okay? Also, uh, children with autism can have fixated interests, a lot of our younger students, like elementary age, they get into things like the Cars movies or Toy Story, or they'll have um, maybe a TV show that they watch all the time. I have a middle school student that I work with um, at our church who is really interested in Pokemon, and that's all he wants to talk about. And that's, you know, it's really hard to get him off of that. The other thing they can kind of get fixated on are um, also focused on objects. So um, Josie has some repetitive behaviors. One of the things that she used to get preoccupied with was closing doors. So you talk about uh, impacting your life. If you have a kid that's really interested in opening and closing doors and they do it all the time, it's, uh, it can be challenging. That kind of wore us out for a little while and um, ended up putting childproof knobs on all the doors so that she couldn't open them because she was about three when she went through this. Uh, the other thing is excessive or limited reaction to sensory input. So students either go one, one end of the spectrum or the other on sensory. Either they're touching everybody a lot, they're in everybody's space, or they don't want to be touched at all. Um, and they won't touch anyone, they won't hug anyone. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is kind of aversion response to sounds. Uh, my brother Phil used to do this with the fire alarm. So if we knew there was going to be a um, fire alarm test at school that day we knew Phil was going to come home sick because that sound was overwhelming to him and it would just make him physically sick. It would scare him so much and he, his his body just was not processing that sound. Um, same with buzzers at basketball games. For a long time we couldn't go to basketball games because that buzzer sound really got him. He got past the fire alarm eventually um, but it took a really long time. The uh, buzzer sound he got passed because he had a special ed teacher in middle school that let him go in the gym and play with the buzzer. And so he turned it on and off himself. He got used to the sound of it. And really that helped him get past it. He goes to basketball games all the time now. Um, so that is sometimes we have to work with our students to get through those environmental um, fears that they have related to sensory input. <clears throat> couple of other things I just point out from the text. If you look at page 210, there's some research findings that I thought were really interested related to restrictive and repetitive behaviors that I would suggest you take a look at just on kind of identifying students with those behaviors and then um, how can we predict a decrease in those behaviors. The, the big point that they made that I thought was really interesting was increases in language, both receptive and expressive really impacted um, young children ages two to three, decreasing their restrictive repetitive behaviors. It was a great predictor that those behaviors would um, get better. And so that was pretty interesting to see.
When we look at language development for students on the autism spectrum, we have some pretty typical language behaviors that we will see uh, with these students. One is inter interrupting others when communicating. Um, this, is, this is really frequent. You probably see this in your classroom if you have students on the autism spectrum. Focusing attention on one topic. So that again gets back to like that kiddo I was talking to you about in middle school that's all about Pokemon. You know, we will be talking about something we're learning in class, and somehow he figures out a way to get that back to the topic of Pokemon every time without fail. So really focused on that one topic. Another interesting thing is reversing pronouns, and you maybe have heard students with autism do this in the, um, in the text. It uses the example of a student asking for a snack, and the student says, you want to have a snack now? But he's really meaning that he wants to, not that the teacher wants to. So sometimes they turn those pronouns around. And that's important as we hear them talking to us and telling us things that we keep that in mind. And um, you know, it really can help us understand better what they're trying to communicate. Uh, repeating or echoing other people's language. Now, you probably have seen students do this. And this is a real challenging behavior to deal with. Um, we dealt with this in my own home with my brother when he was probably 8 and I was 11. He started doing this. For about six months, he repeated everything I said. And I got to tell you, it really impacted us at home because you can imagine you can't say to him, Phil, stop, because he would just say back to me, Phil, stop. So I asked my mom about it years later when I was adult because I'm like, I remember him doing this and it was traumatic to me as a kid. And she said, yes, it was terrible for us as a family because we couldn't even eat dinner together because I couldn't say anything without him repeating what uh, I was saying. And then I would get really frustrated. And so that was a challenge. But that was just really related to his atypical language development. He grew out of that stage, luckily. But it can be, it can be a real challenge. One of the things we really want to talk about when we talk about students with autism is addressing challenging behaviors. Um, <clears throat> the book really points out some really interesting things about behavior that I think is good for us to remember. One is really understanding these predictors for self-injurious behaviors because we do have students with autism that engage in this. About 50% of students identified with autism do things like head banging, biting, scratching, things that are hurting themselves. And there are some predictors that we see that can help us understand if students are going to do this. The four strongest predictors the text talks about is a sensory processing disorder, that need for sameness, lower intellectual functioning, and impairments in social communication. So, you know, one of the things we can do if we see that students pretty strongly have those four predictors, to really work on improving communication and language development. That will help these students kind of grow out of those self injurious behaviors. That's the goal. You know, one of the things that I think is always important for us to remember as educators too when we're looking at behaviors is that behavior really for the most part for our students is just going to be a form of communication. And I think if you look at behavior that way, sometimes it can remove our frustration a little bit with that behavior. Because, I mean, honestly, sometimes our students with autism have behaviors that can be a real challenge for us as educators, right? To deal with in the classroom. They're impacting others. They're, they can be frustrating. Sometimes they can get worse before they get better. But one of the things that always helps me kind of take a step back and think about what is causing that behavior is looking at it as a form of communication. So that student is telling me something by acting that way. Let's say we're getting ready for a transition and I, I tell my student, in five minutes we're going to move to math and they start headbanging, they start screaming, they start throwing things from their table. Well, I can get really frustrated with that behavior that's occurring, but one of the things that helps me is why is he doing that? Was he struggling with the work he was working on and he's starting to get anxious that he's not gonna have it done in that five minutes? Is he anxious about what we're getting ready to do in math? Um, just helps kind of process what's causing that behavior, okay? And the text talks about this a, a little bit. And one of the ways that we get there is by addressing behaviors through a functional behavior assessment called an FBA. And this is something that you're going to do 
over the course of the next few weeks in our group activity. But what an FBA is, basically, and it talks about it in our text in great detail on page 215, but an FBA helps us look at the antecedent, the behavior, and then the consequence. So the antecedent is really what's contributing to the behavior, okay? What, what, is, what could be causing this behavior to occur? What's happening before the behavior occurs? Where does it happen? Um, what are the, does it happen in the regular ed class? Does it happen in the hallway? Does it happen in the special ed classroom? Um, what are the conditions? Is it happening when they're sitting with their peers? Is it happening when they're working with a particular para? All of those things really help us understand um, what we're looking at here related to behavior. And then looking at the consequence. So what does the student gain? What does the student avoid? Okay.